Well, good morning. It's, um, it's been a, a couple of months of looking at elementary doctrines. And uh, some of you, if you've missed out, you need to go get the recordings and work through some of the teachings. Because as we said, these are elementary, elementary doctrines. And elementary doesn't mean unimportant. It means that which is essential upon which we build becomes the foundation of our understanding. And if we do not understand these elementary things, it allows the enemy to have great victory over us in ordinary things in our life. I'll say that again. If we do not have an understanding of these elementary things, it allows the enemy to have victory over us in ordinary things. Because all of our life, that which we do routinely, and I said last week, even without thinking, this should be our default setting that we understand and revert back to operating out of these foundations. Or else... We will be like Matthew 7 speaks of a house that is built on the rock. You can read it there. If our house is built on a rock and Jesus Christ, the Word, is the solid rock. But then the storms will come and the rain descends and the floods come and that happens. Rain descends and floods come. Winds blow. That will happen. That does happen. That's life. That's how life do unto you. It blows and it storms. But those who have a solid rock on which they build, your house will not fall. But if you do not pay attention. If you do not pay attention, it will be as if you've built your house on sand. And that same wind, the same rain that you should be able to sit lekker inside your house and say, thank you Lord for the rain. Thank you Lord for the wind. Thank you Lord for the storms. That will actually cause destruction to you if you do not have these solid foundations. Okay, so today I want you to listen and pay attention because I'm going to test you afterwards. You're going to write a test. Are you ready? So um, not all of you, only those of you who have a cell phone that can go online and we're going to use a little app. At the end of the, or not an app, you don't have to download the app, you can just go online and use this tool, and I'm going to quiz you on everything that I'm speaking about today, because I want to make sure you understand, and you must know when you don't understand that you were just dwelling off here and thinking about the rugby game. Okay. So I want you to listen, get it in your spirit, so that you understand. Is that all right? I don't want you going on your phone now and playing games. I promise you we'll play a game afterwards. Okay, is that right? So that's why I want to get going early, so we've got a bit of time for the game, just to test for your understanding. Is that right? I already spoke of one of the questions that we're going to be asking you. All right. <clears throat> so we're talking about elementary doctrines. And today we're going to speak on the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, which is as elementary and as basic as any doctrine because this forms the basis of our faith. Huh? The doctrine and the understanding of the resurrection of the dead forms the very foundation and the basis of our faith. 
And we're going to be speaking of, of the big picture of the resurrection of the dead. And then we're going to speak of the personal application to us of the resurrection of the dead. Okay? So the big picture is that Jesus Christ is the template. He is the example. And His resurrection from the dead gives us the, the understanding of what we are to experience. I'm going to read a lot from this particular chapter. And we're not going to be able to read the entire chapter because it's got many verses. Well, over 50 verses. 60 or so. But I'm going to take ex excerpts out of it. I want you to go and study this chapter at home. Will you do so? Homework is the work you have to go and do at home. So this is your homework. And even in our discovery groups, we'll, dis we'll discuss a portion of this passage because it's too big. But I want you to go and look at the whole passage of 1 Corinthians 15. Will you make a note of that? Let's read it, verse 12 and to 14, at least, to start with. <clears throat> now, if Christ is preached that he has been risen from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But, very important, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Listen, this is talking about us, not just Christ. It's talking about the personal application now, as well as the big picture. If Christ is not risen, if there is no resurrection from the dead for us, then Christ is also not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty or in vain. Why? Because if Jesus, you cannot believe in Jesus if you do not believe in the resurrection of the dead. You cannot believe in Jesus, and not in the resurrection of the dead. So the hope for us is if you are not going to be raised from the dead, then when you die, you just die. And then everything we're talking about, this Christian lifestyle is really then just that. It's a lifestyle choice. It's not based on truth. It's not based on reality. It's just a lifestyle choice. You can choose to or you can choose not to, and it really does not matter. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, what we're preaching really does not matter. There's no point in, in even believing this Christian philosophy then. And those who want to adhere to a Christian philosophy, you know that 70% or whatever, 80% of South Africa is Christian. You know that. What percentage? 80% of South Africa is Christian. They have a Christian philosophy. Well, I want to challenge you, if your understanding of that is not connected to the understanding of Jesus being resurrected from the dead and how that applies to us, then it's just a lifestyle, it's not even a lifestyle choice, it's a philosophy. And those people will easily turn to any global religion that the Antichrist offers them. Because there will come a time when Satan as the dragon will rule 
on the earth, over all the systems of the earth, including the religious system. The religious systems of this world will be controlled by Satan himself. So when they speak of an interfaith and a one interfaith movement and chutters, you know the enemy is starting to set up for a global religion. And these people, that the resurrection of the dead is, ah, no, 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 I believe to Christian philosophy, they will easily buy into this global religious system. Because it's not that different. It's not that different. But if we say we have the truth, it is based largely on the fact that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Because Jesus said that he is the truth. And I want you to see how very carefully, meticulously, and purposefully God establishes the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead in our understanding. Firstly, if Jesus said that he is the truth, that he is the truth, that he is the life. If Jesus said that this body will die, this temple, and then in three days will be risen, and he proclaims to be the truth, God vindicates, God authenticates, God confirms that to be, in fact, the truth by raising him from the dead. If God didn't raise him from the dead, then Jesus was not the truth, because then he lied. But if he was not the truth and God raised him from the dead, God's a partaker in this lie. He's also in on the, on the, on the fraud deal. Do you see that? But God is very specific, not only to raise him from the dead to authenticate this, and if Jesus is not risen from the dead, any other religion will be the same. But we have a living God. There's lots of religious choices out there. If you want to be religious, crave you. There's thousands of options. Thousands of options. We are not into religion. We serve the one, the only, true, living God. And because our God is alive, this is the basis of the hope we have. You see, Jesus claims to be the way. Not, no other way. Cray for your way. My way is your way. Any way will do. No. Jesus claims to be the way. Very narrow. Oh, you, you followers of Jesus are very narrow-minded. You better believe it. Very narrow. Very narrow. Jesus is the way. The truth. And the life. Not someone noch anna kiesa. He is the person of truth. And God vindicates us by raising him from the dead. And then God makes sure. Remember, Jesus was betrayed by Judas. And we read there in, in Acts 1, if we look at it real quickly, in Acts 1, they get to choose um, another apostle. And this is the criteria. It must be uh, men that accompanied us all the time. And that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So the criteria for another apostle to be chosen 
and they had a couple to choose from. The criteria was he must have also been a witness of the resurrection of Jesus. Why? Why not just leave it 11? The other one messed up now in any case. Why not just leave it 11? 11 will do. No, not in God's eyes. God is very meticulous. And in the Jewish legal custom, for a method to be established as absolutely true, there needed to be 12 witnesses. In fact, Today still, you watch TV when we see the jury. We don't have jury so much in South Africa, ne? But in, in, in the United States, and even in England from, from almost a thousand years ago, there was a jury system, and do you know how many people a jury consists of? Twelve. In the United States, in most of the states, and it was established by law in many of the states, twelve no more and no less. And even though people say, how oh, right, 12, it's an even number, they'll be, rather get an odd number that there'll always be a vote, there'll always be an outcome. No, 12. And it comes from this understanding of Jewish legal custom, that a matter is established as absolutely true by 12 witnesses. God is so particular that he makes sure they bring in another one so that they will be a witness of the fact that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. <clears throat> and the people were convinced that these witnesses and these apostles are believable. In Acts 2 verse 37, they believed them absolutely. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said then to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what now shall we do? They were cut to the heart because this testimony of the twelve stood its ground as absolutely establishing it to be fact. Not only that, God establishes meticulously witnesses that Jesus appears even at one stage in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6. He appears even at one time to over 500 people. Over 500 at once, of whom the greater part remain, they said then were still alive when this uh, Corinthians was written, even though some had passed away by the time this book of Corinth, uh, was written to the Corinthians. The point is, it is not just, oh, uh, you religious nuts, you crazy people, you believe in a fake thing, you need a religious crutch, just, you know, religion is a crutch, and, and you just need this thing to believe, and Jesus is a myth, and, and, and his resurrection is a myth. Have you spoken to some uh, Muslims? There is very few, and if you go to true historians, they will tell you there are very few historical facts that have even remotely as much evidence of fact as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Over 500 on one shot saw him after he died in a resurrected form. God made sure that this essential truth, he goes to every length to establish the resurrection of the dead as verifiable fact. Now there's a push in the world today to say that you can define God any way you want. However you want to define God, all roads lead to Rome Every religion will ultimately get you to God, whether it's Krishna or Buddha or Allah or Lekker Yo. Just do it. The energy of the universe is all God. It will lead you to God. No. God very clearly defines Himself. Do you know how God defines Himself? And Larry said it this morning. By the Spirit, Larry. Yes. And He gives me through. In fact, you know that we sang of the resurrection life today. Some of you just, just sing songs. And some of you didn't even know what you were singing to say, I have this resurrection life. Verdach an ons verstaan. Verdach. And so, he defines himself this way. The God 
and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not any way all roads lead to God, define God as you will, Allah, Buddha, Krishna, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is God. There is only one God. And this is the true God. The living God. And that will not change. No matter how much you want to be tolerant, political correct, munisu, radical vision, God is narrow, narrow, narrow minded. He is only going to be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not whoever wants to make him their God any way they choose. And billions of people on the earth are believing in a God that is the wrong God. Because there's only one. Billions of people in China. Billions of people in India. Billions of Muslims. Billions are believing in the wrong God. They don't have, a resur- don't have a revelation of the resurrected Christ and what that means for us. And that makes all the difference in terms of our faith or else what we preach is in vain. Useless. Might as well preach about, go and get Muhammad's nonsense about what he thinks. Aina, Aina, if Muhammad doesn't teach of a risen Jesus, then he's a fake. Now, it's not hate speech because they can believe whatever they want to believe. And we can believe what we believe. And I'm saying to you, those who believe in Jesus and God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you can't mix that with anything else will do. There is only one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one faith. John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. No one, no one will come to the Father except very narrow through Jesus. Okay. And and in Revelations 2 verse 17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him... Who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone. Jesus says, I am he who was dead and is alive. Maybe it's verse 7 and 8. Might as that. Revelations 1. Revelations 1. If we can find it. But because he... Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. We have an expectation that we too will experience a resurrection. Now there's two aspects of the... So that's the big picture. Jesus and His resurrection from the dead is the big picture. The personal application to us is this. We will experience two aspects of a resurrection of the dead. Two. Two. The first aspect of the resurrection of the dead that you and I experience is while we are alive in the earth. While we are alive, and then there's another expression of the resurrection of the dead we will experience when we die. Or for those of us that die. Okay. Romans 6, from verse 5. Let's look at that. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. 
knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, and that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he, who's he? No, 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 no. He, you can even make it the why. Ye, ye, whoever has died has been freed from sin. If we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. This is important, we'll come back to it. Christ, who has been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. So we get to touch on this again, but I want to say, so when Jesus was walking on the earth after the cross, was he walking around in a body? Yes, he was. Hello. It's just But was it the same body? No. No. And that body, could they kill it? No. Because it was a different body. But it was a body, a glorified body. Because that which has died and resurrected can no longer be killed because he has victory. Are we finished? That goes to verse 11. Let's have a look. Where are we? For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also. Likewise, me also. Reckon yourselves to be dead, indeed to sin. But reckon yourself also to be alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He, Jesus, brings you to death. You've heard me say, it's a good day to die. He brings you to your death. And your death is when you no longer rule. When you no longer rule over your right to make choices over anything in your life on a daily basis. Ek gaan nou mooi praat in liefde. In love, I want to tell you, young people, if you think you have the right to choose To jaw with another girl because it's lekker. I'm telling you, you don't have the right. Or else you've not yet died. And if you've not died, you will not experience the resurrection life. He first brings you to your death. What is your death? What is your death? Tell the person next to you. My death is when I no longer rule and have the right to choose what I want to do. Tell your person next to you. Or else you must go to hell. Listen nicely in love. If you don't want to serve God, then go to hell. Cray for you. Go to hell. If you want resurrection life, you have to die. If you want resurrection life, you have to die. Not just a little bit. Not just when I choose to. Not just if it suits me. If it suits you, then it's still you, and you are still alive, and you are not dead, and if you're not died, you can't be resurrected. 
Is that, can I make it more clear? Sometimes I think, we think this is one big joke. Just religious talk. We just, ah, we just come to church and we do our thing. We yeah because we yeah with our parents or, you know, what else? People got to say, I'm a falach if I don't come to church. And so I'll just do this thing. I'll put up with it. Peter, ach, he's okay, he's handsome, but I don't understand what he's talking about. <laughs> People, this thing is not religious talk. This is the very basis of your life or death. And if I place before you today life or death as a choice, and you say, I'm choosing to do my thing, then pray for you and go to hell. Not that it's about hell. I'm just, I couldn't let like what to say. Because <laughs> I never get to say that to people. Okay. So, when you no longer rule, speak to yourself, self, when you no longer rule, when you give up the right to make the decisions of what you think you want, then God considers that as if you have now died. When you give up the right to rule and make the choice what you want, God considers it that you have now died died. And in that state of death, the Holy Spirit now comes into you and resurrects you. And now you become a new creation. Only that's why we said, when we spoke of the doctrine of baptism in water, that is not the resurrection. That is the burial. We just pull you out of the water so that you don't drown. But it's not a sign of the resurrection. The resurrection takes place now that you've died. The Holy Spirit in your state of die to self, in your state of death, now comes into you. The same Spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead now gives life to your mortal bodies. And He gives a resurrection life in which we live in as a new creation in Christ. Will you agree with me? This stuff is not religious talk. It's about giving up your rights to make decisions every day. There's a lot of, there's a lot of liquor hype in church. There's some churches that build their business model on its liquor hype and we, we get into it here at church. It's liquor and it dints. You could really get into it. But there's no truth. You're not building on the Word of God. And after years of hype, you realize, but I'm still empty. I've not grown. I've not matured. We've been saying, Kom kek tu, van kek kan a lekker jol wees. And I don't mind having a party. Ne, Raphael? We can party. Raphael and I danced last night. <laughs> celebrating his wife's 60th birthday. Dance for the year. Dance with my fro. No, no problem. Having a party. But if church... Service is about a hype so that we can get into it and we can build a lack of model with people just enjoy the vibe and we won't speak truth. We won't speak about sin. We won't address issues because it's what... Man, die. That's my word to you. Die. Give up your right to make a choice. It's a lekkerni, Not for the flesh. But now, when the resurrected life by the Holy Spirit, comes in you and creates in you being a new person, now you enter life. 
Hello, hello. Can you see? It's not about hype. You can, you can go and have a party. And when you experience life, you want to, Joel, and you want to say, praise the year. I'm not a sin to slay, slave to sin. I'm not in death. I don't have to try and do it in my own sense. I can't Joel. But the, the dancing and the jawling is not the life. The Holy Spirit living His life in me is the life. Because you can have all the hype and no understanding of the truth. And your house will fall when the, when the winds come. So Romans 8 verse 12 says very clearly, If Christ is in you, the body is indeed dead. Dead to sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit is life because you are going to now live as the son of God, living his life instead of your life. Righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he, he who raised from Christ, from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that now lives in you. And now, when you're born again, remember you were dead. You died. And as a sign of that death, you were baptized in water, buried. The Holy Spirit now comes and gives life in you, and you are born again, and the first baby cry that you can make now by the Spirit is, Abba, Abba, you are my Father. Oh, I've entered into a new way of living. I found a new way of living. I found a new life divine. Ooh, that's an O song. I am. I'm abiding, abiding. His life is in me. It's no longer I that live. Verstaan. This is work. This is the truth. This is the reality. Ons gaan nog, ooh, jyrlikheid ons gaan. Ek kan tijd van vandag. I want to make sure this is in you. So you're born now again, but you are born from above. Now you're not born from below. This is very important. We've got to deal with this. Why is it important that you are born from heaven? You're born from above and not born from below. You now understand that you are a son of God and not a son of Adam. You are a son as a spirit. Not as a flesh. And so, when you are born again, your spirit instantaneously is saved. Instantaneously. You receive a new divine nature. Immediately, your spirit is saved, redeemed, and born again. Sue so, a Done. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit in sonship. Your soul, that's your will. That's your mind. That's your emotions. That's where you make your decisions. Your soul needs to be redeemed. It's a process of being saved. Being redeemed. Being renewing of the mind. Washing of the word. So that your old stinking thinking can be exchanged for the mind of Christ. Your soul needs to be redeemed, learning to live under submission of the Spirit and not calling the shots. But what about your body? Huh? What about your body? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify, san sanctify you partially. Partially. 
Now may the God of peace himself sanctify two parts of you. No, no. Completely. And may your whole spirit, your whole soul and body be preserved in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word at is also the word in, in, in Greek, in, in. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved in the coming of the Christ. So, you are born from above. Ne? When you're born again, you're born from above, not from below. This is true, but it's not yet obvious. It's not yet obvious because your body here on earth is subject to decay. Is waar. Hy is nie, is nie baie goeie tent nie. Hy gaan nog vrot. And it will return to dust. Right? So, what is the proof that you are born from above? And here's another question. Remember when I spoke about the, what I call junk theology of the rapture? Here's the question. If, if Jesus, when he returns, is going to rapture us, why does he bring with him those who have died? Those who have gone before. Why do they come with Jesus when he returns? Have you ever thought about it? If they're already in heaven, those who have died, where are they? In heaven. So if they're ready with God in heaven, their spirits are there with God in heaven, why would he bring them with him when he returns to the earth? Anyone? Okay. When you die, when you die, you're in Christ and you die, your spirit goes to be with God. But your body goes to the dust. But God's not going to leave it there. Did you hear me? Your body goes to the dust, but God's not going to leave it there. Because he said he's going to preserve spirit, soul, and body at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did he not say that? So your body was in the dust when you died. Ne? But God is going to resurrect you from the dust. And he's going to give you a different body. Okay, let's read. This is the chapter you have to read, eh? 1 Corinthians 15. Let's just read from verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sowed in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, dust, but it is raised a spiritual body, a glorified body. Because there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spirit is not first but the natural and afterwards the spiritual. The first man was on the, of the earth. Made of dust, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, it was sown a natural body. It's going to be raised another body. Did Jesus have a natural body? Did that natural body instantaneously be transformed into another different glorious 
spiritual body. Yes. And it was a body. It looked the same, but different. But we will be changed. Let's keep on reading verse uh, uh, 51 to verse 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Me, sir, this is mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet when Jesus makes his triumphant return as the king, for the trumpet will sound announcing the king is coming and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That body that we receive then cannot be killed. Why? Because it's overcome death. So Jesus has this glorious body that eats fish but walks through walls. Do you remember what happened at Ascension? Jesus was in the midst of them. A cloud appeared. We see this cloud quite often in Scripture, and clouds don't have to be there in the air. In Luke, they were standing, and the cloud, all of a sudden they were in the cloud, which speaks of the presence of God. And the voice of God spoke out of the cloud while they were standing there on the earth. Okay, but Jesus then is taken up to, to heaven. What was taken up? His body. So here we have a glorified body that is able to live in heaven and on earth. Do you see this? Now, you and I are not born from below. We are born from heaven. And God is going to demonstrate this Remember we said, what's the proof? We know we're born from above, but what's the proof? God is going to demonstrate that we are born from above. When he returns, he's going to bring with him from heaven those who have fallen asleep, those who have passed away, whose dust is in the earth. God is going to, out of that dust, call forth a glorious body. Scripture says we're not going to precede them by any means. So they first come with Jesus, receive the glorious body, and then we who are alive and remain, then in a twinkling of an eye, receive our glorified bodies. Different body, but a glorified body. To rule with Him on the earth. Why, Why do we need a body? Because this glorious body, this glorified body, is going to rule with him on the earth. At least for a thousand years when he comes. So it's not a secret mission to, to snatch us away before the world gets so difficult that we can't handle it. No, a glorious return of the king. Bringing with him those who are born of heaven, receiving their glorious bodies of heaven, and those who are now on the earth, the evidence that we are also born of heaven, we receive in an instant glorious bodies as evidence that we are born from above. Do you see this? And so these two resurrections, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and the resurrected life that we now live while alive in the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit as a new creation, is the hope that we have, that even our bodies will not remain in the earth as dust, but we too will be resurrected when Christ returns. Do you see it? Okay, I'm going to go through the summary and then we're going to do a test. Is that right? So Jesus is raised from the dead, which establishes the truth that He is the living God. You are baptized into Christ, 
which means you're baptized into his death. You die to self, and in that state of death, the Holy Spirit now comes and in you resurrects you to newness of life. Life in the Spirit. Do you see that? And these two resurrections give us a hope that we too will be resurrected when Christ returns. And that nothing of us will remain here in the dust. (laughs) There will be nothing of Adam remaining in us. Glorified bodies born from above. When he returns, he'll bring those back with him from heaven. And we who are alive and remain will instantly receive glorified bodies to rule here on the earth with him. Let's just read Thessalonians. There's so many scriptures about this. But let's just read 1 Thessalonians 4 and then uh, we'll, we'll end off with this. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Lest... You mourn as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout With the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Just look at Luke real quickly. Luke 9, verse 24 and 25. I just want to show you this cloud thing so you don't get... The cloud speaks of the presence of God. It speaks of the manifestation of God's presence. It also speaks of a cloud of witnesses. So when the body come together, there's often the cloud of witnesses. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. This is Peter, James, and John. Were fearful as they entered the cloud, standing there in the earth. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. So you see, we, okay, We will be caught up in Him. We will be caught up in Christ together with a whole cloud of witnesses that is the body of Christ now fully visible in the earth.